Rothall or your host book can only be described as a celebration for everyone on Earth. So think about this. Light from the earliest days of the universe has been traveling to us for billions of years. Just over the last few weeks, we've captured some of that light with a telescope that sees the universe in an entirely new way. And today we share the very first results. So longtime space fans are gonna know who this is. This is Dr. John Mather. He's the senior project scientist for the Webb Telescope and a Nobel Prize winner. And John, I couldn't be happier to be here with you today. Thank you, it's a thrill to be here for this very special day. How are you feeling? I am thrilled and I'm relieved because you know when you start something this big, you know there's always a possibility. It might not work, it <laughs> did work. We are so proud. And you've been on this project for a very long time, right? Yeah, I started in 1995. We had just finished measuring the Big Bang. We measured it with a cosmic background explorer satellite that we built right here at Goddard. And we measured the spectrum. We measured there are hot and cold spots in the Big Bang. So we said, now we know it all, how it all got started. But then what happened after that? So then I got a call from NASA headquarters. Would I like to work on this new telescope that's going to help answer those questions? What happened after the Big Bang? How did the galaxies grow? How did the first black holes grow? What happened all the way from there to here? So this is our time machine, and I just wanted to be part of it. I am so thrilled that we got a chance to do it. You know, one of the things that I remember you saying, this is kind of amazing, that you know, after you win the Nobel Prize, you thought that this mission was the most important thing to work on. Absolutely. It's the next question. After you know how it started, what happened then? And <laughs> you know, when suddenly we now have the technology to do it. We didn't have 50 years ago. Didn't have the technology 25 years ago, even when we started this. We had to invent things along the way, so we did that. And here it is. Well, thank you. We'll be back to you in just a moment. So at the moment, we're going to talk about the way that Webb is a completely new way to explore the universe. So today, the mission releases its first science images and gives wings to the dreams of so many people who worked so hard for so long to make this possible. For everyone on Earth, this is your telescope. This is the largest, most powerful observatory ever put into space. It's the product of thousands of people working for more than two decades. This is a, a mission that's singularly focused on the biggest questions in science. So the following phrase is often used too easily, but today actually does mark the dawn of a new era. Today, the web mission is open for scientific business, and this is just the beginning. The best is yet to come. So, John, one of the things you told me about is that you really want to make sure there are some people that get thanked, people that put a huge amount of effort into this. Absolutely. Uh, our current project manager, Bill Oakes, uh, took the project from a time of trouble when we were, didn't exactly know how we were going to get this to work and got it all the way to the end. Here it is. It is working. And it's because of Bill made this worldwide team, 20,000 people around the world were involved in making this thing all work. And Bill has been there every day making sure that it would happen. So uh, other special person is Senator Barbara Mikulski. She saved our telescope and she saved the telescope before us. She made sure after the Hubble telescope was launched and it was not in focus, that we would go up and fix it. She made sure that happened. When the Webb telescope needed more resources, she made sure we could get that. So Barbara, we thank you. <laughs> well, it is such an honor to be with you, Jay. I mean, it's been a pleasure to be working with you through this whole thing. Thank you so much. Congratulations and go web. Thank you. <laughs> so this broadcast, much like every part of this mission, is a partnership. On our journey to explore distant places in space, we've been joined by intrepid travelers from around the globe. We have so many extraordinary collaborators. So let's check in with our partners who will be sharing the stage with us today as we reveal Webb's five first science images. From the European Space Agency, I'm joined by Katie Haswell in Darmstadt, Germany. Katie. I see Katie in the background there. <laughs> also joining us from the Canadian Space Agency in Montreal, we have Natalie Ouellette and Sarah Gallagher. Bonjour. I see Katie in the background there. <laughs> I see the waving too. <laughs> and so naturally, we're also going to be visiting the nerve center of this mission, the Space Telescope Science Institute, on the campus of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. And there we have Alex Lockwood and Carl Gordon, and they're going to give us updates and more. Good morning. morning. Great. So we'll be back with our international partners shortly, where they'll each reveal one of the new images. But today, we're also going to be joined by millions of science fans from around the world. Many are gathered at watch parties just for this event. So here we are really going international. So I'm beginning with Bhopal, India. Do we have a signal from Bhopal? Yes. Excellent. Welcome to NASA. Hello, everybody there. Hello. Wonderful to be Where talking to you today all the way in India. Hello. 
We'll be back to them later. Yes. Great to wave to you. Hi. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all, we also have a warm welcome now in Portland, Oregon. So we have the feed from Portland. A bit dark, but I see everybody there. Hello, Portland. They're in an auditorium, I see. Okay, okay the next we're going to go off to Milan, Italy. So afternoon in Italy. Do we have the feed from Italy? I guess we have a screen from Italy. And uh, next we're going to go to Rutland, Vermont. So is this Vermont? Hello, Vermont. Hi, everybody. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you for being part of this today. Okay, going even a little bit further afield, we have Natanya Israel. Hello. Hello, Israel. Yay. Hey. Really nice to see you guys. Okay, just one more for now. Uh, I, I see people like giving me hugs. <laughs> okay, we also have Vancouver, Canada. Hey, Vancouver. Hi. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful to have all these people with you. So right across from the campus from me, there's also a huge watch party taking place with members of the web team. So the wonderful thing is that they actually are people that have worked on the mission and they are part of our NASA funny family. So hello, hello web team. There they are, yes. <laughs> a lot of people I recognize there. So it's incredibly important to me personally, and also to all of us at NASA, that the universe belongs to everyone. And we are thrilled to share this day with fans everywhere around the world. We'll say hello to some more later in our broadcast. So now it's time to start the main event. What you'll see over the next hour will be a collection of images newly processed by the web science team. Only a tiny handful of experts have seen the images so far. And I can tell you that we have been so excited to unwrap them for everyone. We will be releasing each image in turn in real time. As soon as you see it on this broadcast, it will be available for download on the internet. On the screen below, you can see a timeline showing where we are in the show and what's coming up next. And by the end of the show, all five images will be available to everyone. So hopefully you can tell I'm excited. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, we're going to release the first image right here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, Maryland, and we're just outside of Washington, D.C. NASA Goddard is home to the project office of the Webb Telescope, and the observatory portion of the telescope, the, the mirrors and the science instruments, were integrated and tested here before launch. So for many of us, including myself, seeing Webb come together bit by bit right in front of our eyes was an emotional and very inspiring experience. So it's kind of like a part of us was out there with Webb right now. A million miles away, part of our hopes and dreams are out there. So I'm joined now by Jane Rigby, the operations project scientist for the web mission. And she's a familiar face for people who've been following this before. So welcome, Jane. Hi, Michelle. Okay, so Jane, you not only get the honor of revealing the first image, but th this actually got a little bit of a sneak preview. I understand yes. there was a very select audience who's already seen the image. Yes, so last night uh, on behalf of the project, I had the privilege of traveling to the White House uh, with, the Nelson, with the NASA Administrator Nelson and other senior sh staff to share our first image with President Biden and Vice President Harris. And it, it was really fun. Oh my gosh. Um, we're, uh, they really geeked out. We had a closed door session where we got to walk through all the images and just share the excitement. And they were so thrilled and they got the profundity of what we're seeing. And so now we're gonna, we're gonna let's do it. Okay, we've got the whole world watching. Are you ready to put the first image up? Oh, let's do it, let's do it. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, here we go. Ah, okay. <laughs> So the first image is a deep field, and it's also a deep field with a cluster. So why don't we walk through this just a little bit? So if we come up and look at this image, first of all, it's really gorgeous, yeah. and it's teeming with galaxies. And that's something that has been true for every image we've gotten with Webb. We can't take blank sky. Everywhere we look, there's galaxies everywhere. And so, you know, this, gal this, this image, as we're looking at it, what we're seeing is not just all the galaxies, but there's a cluster here. And so the cluster are all these white kind of ethereal galaxies. We're seeing them as they looked back in time, right? The speed of light is only so fast. And so as we're seeing distant galaxies out in space, we're seeing them as they looked billions of years ago. So these cluster galaxies, the white ones, we're seeing as they looked about the time the sun and the earth formed. And then behind the cluster, we have uh, the cluster, the, the the gravity of the cluster is distorting and warping our view of what's behind. And so there are these galaxies that look 
pulled, kind of like, like they've been magnified because they've been magnified by the gravity of the cluster, just like Einstein said they would. And you know, it's really, there's so much detail here. We're seeing these galaxies in a way that we've never been able to see before. There's just a sharpness and a clarity we've never had. And so we can look at, if we zoom in on this image, and I encourage you as you grab this image at home, like zoom in, it, you can you know, really zoom in and play around. There are galaxies here in which you're seeing individual clusters of stars forming, popping up just like popcorn. Um, and then we also see in the background of this, galaxy, of this image, kind of littered like jewels all over the back of the image are these faint red galaxies. Now, that was what we built the telescope to do. The most distant of those are billions of years. We're seeing as they looked more than 13 billion years ago. And so galaxies like that one right there, this little red guy, you're like, OK, yep. What is that? Well, Webb got spectra to figure out what those galaxies are made of. And this is that one. We're seeing as it looked. 13.1 billion years in the past, less than a billion years after the Big Bang. And we're seeing the elements of oxygen and hydrogen as well as neon. You know, this is the kind, this is how the oxygen in our bodies was made in stars, in galaxies. And we're seeing that process get started. I just, I want to give this a little bit of context. So this is now the farthest away galaxy that we have this sort of detailed information about. That we know what it's made of. We know like what it's that. made of. Yes. And this was not a long exposure for Webb. No, the, 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 pre the previous record holder, right, the Hubble uh, Extreme Deep Field, mm -hmm. was two weeks of continuous work with Hubble. And it was just imaging. With Webb, we took that image before breakfast. The amazing thing about Webb is the speed at which we can churn out discoveries. So everything that you're going to see here in this broadcast is a week. And we're going to be doing discoveries like this every week. That is absolutely incredible, Jane. So thank you so much for joining us. I, it's been an honor to be working with you. Congratulations on all your hard work. <laughs> thank you. It's so wonderful to see it pay off. So thank you. And I'll see you later on today, I hope. So yes. enjoy the day. Thank you. All right. So from distant galaxies, we now turn our eye to something a bit closer. It's a planet, but not one in our solar system. Remember that Earth and its sibling planets aren't the only show in the universe. When scientists and engineers started developing JWST, the search for exoplanets wasn't even part of the plan. That's changed. Exploring exoplanets is now a major component of the mission and the subject of our second big reveal of the day. I'm going to send it now to our friends Natalie Ouellette and Sarah Gallagher at the Canadian Space Agency in Montreal. So again, bonjour. I guess we're, we're, we're having a little... Sorry for the brief uh, pause there. We're now going over to Canada. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep, we're all ready. Yeah. Okay, I apologize. We're having some trouble with the signal from Canada. But luckily for us, we have an exoplanet expert right here, just in case that happened. So this is Nicole Colon, and she's uh, an exoplanet scientist at NASA. And we're going to talk about this amazing new result from a very hot planet, I understand, about a thousand light years away. That's right. The exoplanet is named WASP 96b, and it is this hot gaseous giant puffy planet that it is about a thousand light years away. So that's why today's release is so exciting that's because it teases out what that was able to do for such a distance. Absolutely. So talk us through what this discovery is and, and why this is so significant. Mm -hmm. Well, this uh, reveal that you're going to see is going to show the first spectrum of an exoplanet as taken from the Webb telescope. And this is exciting because it covers infrared wavelengths of light that we have not had access to before. Mm -hmm. So we've been able scopes to explore exoplanet atmospheres in the infrared, but not to this level of detail. And this is just one sliver of data that using the nearest instrument specifically. 
And there's something about um, infrared that is actually particularly good for, for the spectrum. So in this, in this case, what we're doing is we're actually going to take the light and break it up into a rainbow and look very, very carefully at how much color is coming in each in each part of the, the spectrum. So I believe we have that image, if we can put that up. Okay, yes, I, I believe we're revealing the spectrum right here. <laughs> so we now have our spectrum, and this is exactly what you're seeing. As you just described with spectroscopy, what we did was we observed a transit of an exoplanet. We observed the planet as it passed in front of the star. Now, mind you, this is not a direct image. This is an indirect image. So we've seen the effect of what happens when the planet and its atmosphere passes in front of the star. The starlight filters through the atmosphere. And then you can break that down into wavelengths of light. And you get a bunch of what looks like bumps and wiggles to some people, but it's actually full of information content. So you're actually seeing bumps and wiggles that indicate the presence of water vapor in the atmosphere of this exoplanet. So we have the spectrum up here. Is there anything mm -hmm. you'd like to, to highlight particularly? Yeah, absolutely. So we have um, several features marked here. So I call them features. They are these what I just referred to as bumps and wiggles. But what you're seeing here is a telltale signature, the chemical fingerprint of water vapor in these atmospheres, in the, in the atmosphere of this specific exoplanet. And the other thing we can tell actually is that there's evidence of clouds and hazes because the water features are not quite as large as we predicted. So we can take that and infer that there are presence of clouds and hazes. Right. Now, one thing that we really want to make sure people understand is with this particular planet, this is a hot world. It's actually closer to its star than Mercury is to our sun. Mm -hmm. And so we're not looking at liquid water here, but we're, we're looking mm -hmm. instead of at, at sort of steam, water vapor. Yes, this is a an exoplanet. It's a, about the size of Jupiter, about half the mass of Jupiter. It orbits around a sun-like star, but it does it every about three and a half days. Right. So it's extremely hot, extremely close in, nothing like our solar system planets, but that's okay because what we're seeing is again the first exoplanet data from Webb. And this is just the beginning. We're going to start pushing down to further smaller planets and being able to take measurements just like this with the NEARS instrument that um, was built by the Canadian Space Agency. But also there's other three, three other science instruments that will add to our knowledge in the infrared as well as direct imaging modes along with the transit method. So there's a lot more to come. I guess one thing we should mention is not only are we going to be looking at planets that are more like the Earth in the future, but we'll also be looking at planets in our own solar system. Absolutely, yes. We're going to have um, exciting data from planets in our solar system, from Mars uh, outward, as well as asteroids and comets. So stay tuned for a lot more to come. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you so much for telling us about the spectrum, and I'll be seeing you later on today. <laughs> So we have three more big image reveals, and with that new and more exciting science. But first, let's take a look back at the journey that brought us to this moment. Celebrations like this one are only possible with years of hard work from a cast of thousands. When a new mission is being built, even the most enthusiastic space fans only get to see dramatic moments in this life cycle, the news and images that come out in updates and press releases. But that doesn't really give you the sense of the huge effort that goes on behind the scenes every day. The plan, schedules, and organization to keep everything moving forward really happens, for the most part, out of people's gaze. Webb started as an idea that took root at NASA Goddard. It grew at first into planning teams, research projects, schematics, requirements. Then it began the long journey to become real with the development of new technologies, cutting edge engineering, and finally fabrication, putting it all together. Let's take a brief look back at the visionary journey to how we all got here today. So today was the final closeout of the purge. Okay, guys, I can hear Rupa, so but it's a pretty emotional moment to be in there and actually, you know, closing it up for the very last time, right? You know, you're the last one to touch this. Man. So that was the final operation. And once that fitting is closed out, um, there's no more touching of the vehicle. We're ready for launch. The James Webb Space Telescope, born from the desires of astronomers, achieved with newly invented technology, is the culmination of 20 years of work. I'll be bringing on some guests in the next hour. Humanity has unlimited Thanks questions about our universe. Engineering a way to investigate them requires enormous creativity. Webb has been a trade-off between engineering performance, the, what the astronomers want, risk, 
In fact, when we started 20 years ago, we were actually looking at an eight meter telescope. Developing the most sensitive instruments and testing and more testing. And so you don't want to build one that's just incrementally better than what you've got. Because if that's the case, you would just observe longer on the telescope you've already got. And so every time NASA builds a new astrophysics mission, a new telescope, it needs to be way more sensitive, you know, way more capable than anything we've ever built before. We all got together in that conference room and we played real time as the images came down uh, from the spacecraft, uh, the very first diffraction limited images ever obtained with Webb. And what we collectively saw as a group was the highest resolution infrared image taken from space ever. If you're just joining us, I'm Michelle Fowler at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and you are watching live coverage of the release of the first science images from the James Webb Space Telescope. So it's appropriate now that I send the broadcast to our colleagues and friends at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. That's the scientific nerd center of the entire Webb mission. So hello, good morning, Alex. The show is yours. Hey, Michelle. Welcome to the Space Telescope Science Institute. I'm Alex Lockwood, and I'm here with Carl Gordon, who is an astronomer and one of the key people in delivering the images that you're going to see here today. But actually, before we get into the amazing images, we're going to talk a little bit about where we are. We're sitting here outside of the Mission Operations Center, which is the key central hub for Webb. For the past six months, scientists and engineers have been working 24-7 since they took control of the telescope 30 minutes after a launch to prepare for today and for the amazing science to come. Through all of the major deployments, focusing, aligning the telescope, and calibrating those four amazing science instruments, it was all done in this building. And from here on out, we'll have daily communications with the telescope, including sending commands and downloading data with the help of the Deep Space Network. In addition to mission operations, we are also the home of science operations. Well, what does that mean? Every year, we solicit proposals from astronomers across the country for and the world for what they would like to look at with Webb. Then we hold a rigorous selection process to select the ideas that will best utilize Webb to study And we knew that today was gonna to be so exciting with the first images. So we've actually been preparing for years. Here is Klaus Pantopadin, project scientist for Webb and the technical lead for the first images. Yeah, it's been a year to tell you process. about the process of the past few years. I look back and my first email targets. related to the, uh, the first images was back from 2016. Uh, so back then uh, a committee was created and this committee was charged with coming up with a long list of targets for the first images. And the reason for that is that the observatory can't see the entire sky at any given time. And this is because you want to avoid the mirror seeing direct sunlight to keep it cold. It actually had to be quite a long list. We ended up with about 70 targets from which we had to select only a handful. You know, what would create the most beautiful images, what would highlight the instruments, the four different four science instruments for web and what would highlight the four uh, major science themes for web and it's a celebration as well of the beginning of science observations and we knew that selecting the images was just the beginning that we would need a trained eye to take these exquisite data and pull out the beauty and the science potential so here's jody pasquale and elisa pagan to tell you about how they processed these beautiful images. And they, they have them up downstairs. I think they missed some of that beginning. Oh We're basically translating light that we can't see into light that we can see by applying uh, color like red, green, and blue to the different filters that we have from web. And the reason we want to color the images is because there's actually more that you can get, more information that you can get from the image if you see it in color. 
So it's a matter of picking and choosing filters and colors that enhance the details and the structure in the image itself. The shortest wavelengths of infrared light and assign those blue colors and then move our way down to green and red as we go to longer and longer wavelengths. And then we additively combine those together to get our full color image. But there is a lot of aesthetics that are involved in this. And painstakingly going through and cleaning these images up uh, with a, an attention to detail, a level of detail like at the pixel level in every image. So when I'm working on the astronomical data, it is this sort of marriage between art and science. When you're choosing colors for the filters, you really are trying to show the different details and the processes that are happening in astronomical images. But at the end of the day, you want it to be very compelling. You want it to be very beautiful. Space is beautiful. And after those images were processed, it was a select few of us, very lucky few of us, who got to see the first images. That was a downscale uh, factor of four. So, so just to make it a little more and more handy, so it's actually higher resolution. So we have a team of about 30 people who are producing these images, and we feel incredibly privileged to be the ones were the first to see these science-like images. When, when we saw the first data come down of real targets, people were speechless and there were emotions because we immediately we could see how amazing this observatory would be. The detail, the sharpness, the depth. And when we saw the first color images, we knew that we had a winner. And now we are ready to see Webb's first image of a star dying a planetary nebula called the Southern Ring. Let's do it. Oof. Wow. Wow. This, this near infrared image is wow. The detail. Oh. <laughs> Wow, okay, well, here we are. We have a near infrared image on our left, or on maybe your right. <laughs> and here on the right, we have a near infrared image. Um, and so I'm here with Carl, our, our astronomer uh, specialist. Can you tell us what we're looking at in these images? So this is a planetary nebula. It's caused by a dying star that has expelled a large fraction of its mass over in successive waves. Okay, so we actually see those waves in these images. Yes. Um, Wow, wow. And so there's a lot of structure. Can you tell us a little more detail about what we're looking, maybe start with this one on the left? Yeah, so in the, in the near cam image, you see this kind of bubbly, uh, you know, almost foamy appearance throughout the whole nebula with some very structured uh, shells. But the, and this foaminess is showing up in orange mainly. And this is, this is due to the molecular hydrogen that's newly formed in the expansion, uh, just lighting up the gas and dust of this nebula. And then as we move inward, you see this kind of very uh, blue haze in the inner region. And this is actually due to very hot ionized gas that emits well in the blue um, that's heated by the core, the leftover very hot core of this star. And what about these like rays that I'm seeing in this image? Right, there, so there's also rays in the outer regions that you can kind of see, and these are holes in the inner nebula that are actually allowing the, the central star's light to come out and kind of light it up like, uh, you know, patchy clouds with the sun shining through. Wow. Oh, yeah, that's what it looks like. That's so cool. Um, so you're actually a mid-infrared astronomer, which is different than near-infrared. And so what can you tell us about the details in this mid-infrared image? So this is, it looks quite different in color, um, partly because we're, we're seeing different kinds of physics going on here. So we're actually seeing in the blue, you see a lot of blue. The blue is actually due to hydrocarbon grains that are emitting very strongly in the blue for Miri. And they show the very similar structures to what we see in orange and near cam because the, the hydrocarbon, the molecular hydrocarbon actually forms on the surface of dust grains. And so again, as we move inward, we, we see that, that the inner region is again hot ionized gas, but now it glows red because that's where it emits longest for the strongest for Miri wavelengths. Okay. And then as we go into the center, we see kind of the surprise for us, which is we knew this was a binary star, but we, we 
effectively didn't really see much of the of the the actual star that produced the nebula. But now in Miri, this star glows red because it has dust around it. So in Miri, we got to see both stars very clearly. Yeah, yeah, you can't see it in first image really, but there's two stars there. So that's a fun surprise. Um, and I think that there's another little Easter egg you want to tell us about? Yeah, so this was, uh, the Easter egg is this kind of uh, narrow filament up in the up in the top that's radially aligned. You can kind of see it very clearly in the Miri image. It shows up as this blue blue structure and it points very much to the central sources. So I thought, oh, this must just be a density enhancement in the outer nebula. I thought that very, very strongly, but other people on the team were like, no, it's a background edge on galaxy. Well, I made a bet that said, no, it's part of the nebula. By the way, I lost the bet because then we looked more carefully at both the near cam and mirror images and it's very clearly an edge on galaxy with a dust lane and a bulge. So I lost the bet. Well, you lost the bet, but you got these gorgeous images. So I think it's a win for everybody. Anything else you'd like to say today? I can't wait to see where we go from here. Oh, neither can I. All right, thanks so much. Back to you, Michelle. Thank you, Alex and Carl. And I have to say that image is absolutely spectacular. So as you know, people from all over the world are watching us today and joining in, a, in our excitement as we release for Webb's first science images. We've been checking in with our colleagues in Europe and Canada throughout the program, but we also want to take a moment to include the people at the oh so many viewing parties scattered around the world like stars in the night sky. So let's check in with some of them now. First, we go all the way to Perth, Australia. Do we have a signal from Perth? I guess nothing from Perth right now. Uh, maybe we have some of our other feeds. We're going to check in with them right now. Do we have Winnipeg, Canada? Oh, there it is. There's Australia. There's Perth. Hey, waving to Perth, Australia. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, next we're going to Winnipeg, Winnipeg, Canada. Hello, Winnipeg. At a planetarium. Everybody's enjoying the show, I hope. Okay, Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> Everybody's watching on the... Uh, there we go, Dayton, Ohio. Hello, everybody, Dayton. Nice to have you here with us. There we go, yes. Hey, hey, Dayton. Hey, <laughs> they're jumping up and down. <laughs> Hi. Okay, all the way, Bangalore, India. India, Bangalore. Hello, hello, hello to Bangalore, India. Hey. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. Hey. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I hope you enjoy the, the rest of the images we're releasing. Okay, of course, NASA's family extends all over the country. The team at JPL in Pasadena, California, they're on site to celebrate with us. So hello, JPL. Some of my favorite people in the world. Hey, hello. And then I think the last place we're going to right now is North of Grumman, one of our major contractors. Hello, North of Grumman. Oh, hey, all right. <laughs> It's great fun to see the enthusiasm here. Um, we'll be discussing this shortly. I have an invite out to a couple of guests and hopefully they can come on. Uh, just in case you're tuning in uh, belatedly, I'm doing a bit of a uh, an impromptu pop-up showing of the uh, images being released by the web, the James Webb Telescope. To me, the significance, obviously there's much scientific significance in the details of these galaxies and these other uh, revelations from so far away and so long ago, but there's also enormous ramifications in considering human sustainability. This whole enterprise wouldn't be possible without the ingenuity that we've <laughs> applied to so many things, both war and peace, science and uh, food production, so many different avenues where uh, our technology has allowed us to expand uh, human possibility but also has uh, given us an outsized impact on the planet in uh, which is now pushing back in some ways. You know, we've had great human progress uh, through these years, through the decades I've been alive since the space race began, 1950s. And um, we're still continuing that journey, the idea of the end of science. My friend John Horgan wrote about a long, long time ago. Uh, seems kind of fantastical when you realize uh, what new um, insights can emerge from this kind of uh, upward look. And we need kind of a space telescope 
for looking at ourselves too. Uh, the social sciences uh, don't really have the tools yet to get inside how we think, not just the physiology of the brain, but the the dynamics of how we perceive things, misperceive things, how we cooperate or or, or end up in conflict. That's the next frontier. There should be a web telescope that uh, looks inward. Um, it's a lot harder. The social sciences are harder. They're, they're not hard data. They're not pixels. They're about often uh, dynamics and perceptions, even of the researchers themselves. So th that's kind of my view of this moment is about what this reveals for us. And also the emptiness of space is, uh, I was tweeting this morning with some friends who are astrobiologists and and who um, have tried to use numbers to calculate probabilistically whether and how long they might have persisted. Uh, there are other civilizations, however you did define that term. So we're gonna dive into this, uh, the live feed again, but I'm here for you and I would love to hear your questions if you're watching and do share this with others. Um, I'm gonna stay on for a little while longer. I do have a lot of work today, <laughs> including writing uh, more and uh, run a panel later on uh, climate mobility. How do we, uh, as climate changes, what can be done to facilitate uh, in ways that are just uh, people uh, moving, not just uh, not just as refugees, but as a dynamic uh, opportunity, opportunity seeking human beings. Uh, so we're gonna get back into the, uh, the uh, live stream in a second. They're still showing you some general reviews of uh, the technology that went into play here. Um, so post a question or two if you're watching, do share this with others. Just share the link you're watching on, on social media with somebody right now or pop an email to them. It's easy to do and uh, engage here. I'd like to hear from you. I'm gonna go back into the live stream and uh, listen in a little bit more. Uh, let me just unmute them. had the mute button earlier. Unmute. There we go. Europe and the US. MIRI detects mid-infrared light from planets, stars and galaxies. It can analyze molecules to help us deduce what astronomical objects are made of and peer into clouds of gas and dust where stars and planets are born. Together, these instruments will help Webb detect and analyze light from the very dawn of time, revealing the universe as never before. So, so let's get ready to reveal our image. And remember, that one of Webb's jobs is to find out about galaxies, more about the galaxies, but also to help us to understand how they change. And this image is going to be very, very useful for that. Let's reveal it now. There it is. It's called Stefan's Quintet, and it's wondrous. Giovanna, what are we looking at? Yes, like you said, a quintet. So we are looking at five galaxies. Galaxies are... Uh, this giant structure that, as we've seen, we see everywhere around us in the universe, they contain from million to hundred billions of stars. And in fact, we live in one of them, the Milky Way. And here we see uh, five of them. This is a, a closer um, a galaxy uh, in the foreground. And these four are uh, at a distance of about uh, uh, 300 uh, million light years from us. And they're locked in a close interaction, a sort of cosmic cosmic dance driven by the uh, gravitational force. Um, you can see here these two uh, in a process of merging uh, within each other. This is a very important image uh, and an area to study because it really shows uh, the type of interaction that drives the evolution of galaxies. That, that, uh, that's the mechanism of galaxies growth. I love this image of the cosmic dance <laughs> moving through each other. Uh, Mark, there's a lot going on though in this image, isn't there? There is. So this is a near infrared image and a mid infrared, in infrared image combined. And when we zoom in 
on the uh, left-hand side here, we see this foreground galaxy. We see lots of individual stars in there actually resolved as point sources, which is remarkable. And then as we pan across, we actually see the, the galaxies in the, the merging galaxies. We now see gas and dust, which is being heated up in the collision between those galaxies. And that's place where new stars are being born today. So we're actually seeing the process of creation of new stars in this region. And then when we look in the background here, we see not only the galaxies at 300 million light years, but also stars in our own galaxy, these um, snowflake uh, structures that you see here, those are nearby stars, but in the corner and around the edges, we see galaxies which are much, much more distant, much further away. So similar in some sense to the ones that we saw early on in that deep field. And so this image actually takes us from the nearby galaxy, our own Milky Way, through these galaxies which are evolving today all the way to the distant universe. And it, in a way, it captures cosmic evolution of galaxies over those 13.8 billion years. So we have another image, don't we, that we can exactly. look at? Exactly. So, so if we strip away the near-infrared view there of the stars, predominantly now in the mid-infrared with MIRI alone, we see mostly gas and dust. So we've seen the same galaxies again, the two merging. And then we also see something very interesting up at the top here, because this top galaxy has something new and bright in the middle of it. And Giovanna, tell us what that is. Yeah, that's uh, an active black hole. We cannot see the black hole itself, but we see the material swirling around being swallowed by this sort of cosmic monsters. And that gets, uh, this gas gets heated to extremely high temperature as it falls onto the black hole and it becomes very bright. In fact, this is our shine, it's the galaxy here. We see uh, luminosity that are 40 billion times the luminosity of our suns, it's really, really bright. And uh, with near spec, we can zoom into this area and we have this technology that allows us to take uh, um, thousands of images at different wavelength channels uh, so see the uh, the, the this distribution of the gas what's going on in the gas uh, in different regions uh, of the of this core area and understand the, the composition of the gas the velocities um, the temperature so that's imp very important to understand the physics so it's, it's object. giving us so much information and it just shows the power of this telescope mark this is just the beginning though isn't it I think that's a very important takeaway from today. You know, we these are like pictures just taken over a period of five days, and every five days we're getting more data, which will contribute more in that in that direction. It's a culmination of decades of work, but it's just the beginning of decades. And you know what we've seen today with these images is essentially that we're ready now. This telescope is working fantastically well. And you know, to to, to borrow a phrase from a famous rock musician, you know. We're ready to turn this telescope up to 11. It really is time. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, both of you. Back to you, Michelle. Thanks, Katie. It is so great to have you and your colleagues with us on this historic day. So before we get to the fifth and final image reveal of the day, it cannot be said enough that an achievement like the James Webb Space Telescope is something bigger than any one of us. It's bigger than any organization, any country. This truly takes a planet. Web belongs to all of us. And starting today, the discoveries start and they're not gonna stop. This is just the beginning. We've said several times throughout the broadcast that the Web mission is about people. And during the construction of the Great Telescope, people started to see themselves in it, literally. Day after day, people visited the observation window at NASA Goddard. And looking through the glass, they snapped selfies of themselves reflected in the gigantic golden mirror. These photos are actual reflections of the enormous human investment and the emotional commitment that brought this mission to life. And now, years later, that mission is finally collecting light from the earliest days of the universe, all the way to worlds in our own solar system. It's the same mirror that reflected the many faces who see themselves as part of the journey to understand our shared origins. Let's stop for a moment and appreciate the people behind Webb. Okay, it's time now for the last image to be revealed. Here we go. Sorry. So Amber Strawn is Webb's deputy project scientist. She's here with me today to share the final big reveal of the day. So Amber, it is so good to see you. How are you feeling? Oh, 
so great, so exciting. What a, what a great day this is. Yes. So one of the things that we're gonna do is before we get to the final image, the James Webb Space Telescope has taken us all over the universe today. So let's do a quick review of where we are. Okay. So Jane Rigby got us rolling today with an extraordinary new deep field image, showing us one of the farthest views of the universe ever. Yeah, this image really does demonstrate that JWST can do exactly what we've designed it to do. Yes. And uh, the Canadian Space Agency then took us to the massive planet WASP-96b, where the team has detected evidence of atmospheric water. And here again, we're seeing the incredible efficiency of this observatory. We're able to do these kind of measurements in a fraction of the time that we are, were able to before. And then we zipped up the road from NASA Goddard to the Space Telescope Science Institute, where Alex and Carl showed us the exquisite Southern Ring Nebula, a mixing bowl of stellar matter around a pair of dying stars. Yeah, and I'm just blown away by the level of detail we can see, like in the outer part of, of this nebula. It's incredible. Wow. Okay. After that, it was off to Germany, where the European Space Agency wowed us with pictures of galaxies interacting and mixing together. Right, and this image, again, it's just, it's incredible because it's showing us one of these fundamental processes of the universe, how galaxies merge together. And we're able to learn about these processes in a brand new way. <laughs> so the web team has a lot to cheer about right now. So across the campus, there's this big watch party and we can feel the excitement all the way from over here. So let's join that celebration now. We're back with senior project scientist, John Mather, along with the head of NASA science mission director at Thomas Zerbuchen. Hello. So, uh, John, we looked around the world and we're the only ones with a cheerleading <laughs> crew right over there. That's amazing. Uh, look, uh, you've been with this mission for decades. Uh, how do you feel today? I am so thrilled and so relieved. This was so hard and we took, it took so long. Um, it's just impossible to convey how hard it really was. That we risked so much to say we're going to go do this and it's so near impossible. But we did it. Yeah, there are thousands way, thousands of ways this can go wrong. Yes. Uh, many of them, uh, you know, we worried about and, and frankly feared even after launch. I have to tell you, I was really, really nervous. And, you know, it's almost like athletics for me. You always get to know the team when they're on the field. And on the field, they were right after this launch and they were perfect. They absolutely were. And I really wasn't worried, but maybe I should have been. Yeah, that's that's difference between the two of us. I always worry. I always tell everybody I'm paid to worry, uh, frankly, uh, and, and, and that's good. Uh, what we want to do, though, is, you know, just really thank the team again. You know, of course, we heard uh, Bill and Scott and uh, Greg talking about the team that is there. I think what's also important is to recognize that Bernie is sitting there. It was the first uh, manager. I was sitting there. Could you stand up? And... Uh, and I want to mention that Phil Sablehouse, who is a manager uh, also during a time, is no longer with us, but uh, his heart is with us today. Yeah. I, I have to tell you, I have to tell you, John, uh, after each one of these milestones, I called a lot of people. I called Bernie, for example, and I called uh, people who had my job and people uh, who are administrators because there's many of them. And I just wonder how you feel about the team. Just uh, give you the word here. I am just so thrilled that we had a privilege to assemble such a brilliant team. We drew from the best of the best, and here we are. So my extreme deep thanks go to all the people who built that team, not only to Bernie, who started us and helped us build up all the technology, to Phil, who made sure we would have a plan, and then when we didn't have quite enough money, to Bill, who pulled it all together and made it get all the way to the end, I am so thrilled that we had so much talent to draw on. And here we are, we have the support of the country and the world to take on this immense challenge. You know what I'm most excited about? There's tens of thousands of scientists, and frankly, some of them just got born or not even born, yeah. uh, who, are, who are benefiting from this amazing telescope because it will be with us for decades. It will be. That? We have, it took us about 25 years to get here since 1995, and we have at least 25 to go. I hope. So look, uh, we are in a sense of, uh, of these images. The 
Paterno Sky revealed for the first time. We're thinking of the team and we're thanking them. John, thanks to you. Thanks to all of you. And back to Michelle. Thank you so much, Thomas. And this entire collection continues to just absolutely astound me. Okay, Amber, so here it is. Can you walk us through the final image reveal? <laughs> absolutely. Here we go. The last image is, wow, look at that. So Amber, can you, can you tell us a bit about what we're seeing here? Of course. This stunning vista of the cosmic cliffs of the Carina Nebula reveals new details about this vast stellar nursery. Today, for the first time, we're seeing brand new stars that were previously completely hidden from our view. Is there something you want to point out here? Absolutely. So. Honestly, it took me a while to even figure out what to call out in this image. There's just so much going on here. It's so beautiful. One thing that really, really stands out to me is you sort of get this sense of depth and texture from this new data. Um, there's just, there's a lot going on. To call out a few specifics, first of all, in general, Carina Nebula is a nearby star forming region within our own Milky Way galaxy, about 7,600 light years away. Um, and in this view, we see some great examples, first of all, of hundreds of new stars that we've never seen before. We see examples of bubbles and cavities and jets that are being blown out by these newborn stars. We even see some galaxies sort of lurking in the background up here. We see examples of structures that Honestly, we don't even know what they are. Like, what's going on here? There's just, there's, the data is just so rich. And there's something really special about the infrared. Infrared can actually see deeper into these star forming regions. Absolutely. That's one of the great things about infrared is it really does reveal uh, what's going on here in a, in a really cosmic sense. And in general, what's happening in sort of this overall landscape is we have these gigantic, hot, young stars up here to the top of this rim. And the radiation and stellar winds from those stars is sort of pushing down and running into all of this. This is gas and dust. And of course, we know that gas and dust is great raw material for newborn stars and baby planets. But there's a flip side to this story and also a little bit of a mystery because these same processes can serve to sort of erode away this material and stop star formation. So we have this sort of delicate balance going on of new stars being formed, but at the same time, the star formation is being halted. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I see an image like this, I can't help but think about scale. You know, every dot of light we see here is an individual star, not unlike our sun, and many of these likely also have planets. And it just reminds me that, you know, our sun and our planets and ultimately us were formed out of the same kind of stuff that we see here. We humans really are connected to the universe. We're made of the same stuff in this beautiful landscape. And actually the Carina Nebula was one of my favorite images from Hubble. So Hubble looked at this as well, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The Hubble image of this is also spectacular. We saw it in a, a different kind of light when, when Hubble uh, took an image of this, of this uh, particular nebula. And then you can see amazing things with Hubble, but when we zoom in to this new image, we're able to see so much more detail. And of course, all of us, you know, I grew up <laughs> on Hubble and all of us uh, love Hubble. And I'm just, I'm so excited to see what these two amazing observatories are able to do really in tandem with each other. Thank you so much. And again, congratulations. It's been a pleasure to be working on this with you. I, I'm just amazed by what's been going on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So as we're wrapping up, one of the things that I really have to say is the, 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 the journey that we've been going on is so very dramatic for me. So we've gone all the way from the birth of stars and we have all the way through the distant galaxies to the birth of stars. This is where we all began. This was the whole point of the James Webb Space Telescope to figure out our origins from the very, very early days of the universe to star and planet formation very nearby. So right now, I'm very honored to have our last special guest. Uh, this is the administrator of NASA, Bill Nelson. An honor to be with you, sir. Hey, what a pleasure. What, what a banner day. Uh, it's clear that Webb represents the best of NASA. It maintains our ability to propel us forward for science, for risk-taking, for inspiration. 
And we don't want to ever stop exploring the heavens nor stop daring to take another step forward for humanity. In the words of the famous Carl Sagan, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. I think those words are becoming reality. Absolutely. Thanks, Michelle. An honor to have you here. Thank you very much. Wow. So this is a celebration for all humanity. If you've ever looked up at the night sky and wonder, whoever you are, wherever you are, this is your telescope. And we also salute the thousands of people who have dedicated part of their lives to making Weber reality. I also want to give a big shout out for the superb media team who's helped bring Web story to the world. This broadcast is a joint effort of the superstar producers, animators, and social media specialists at the Canadian Space Agency, ESA, NASA, and especially the Goddard Space Flight Center. Web captures light in distant colors that the eye can't see, and you've actually made this visible to the world. So finally, if you go to nasa.gov slash web first images, you can download all of the images and data we've just shown in full resolution and check back often. From now on, we share new discoveries, exciting new destinations around the universe. July 12th, 2022 marks a huge day for science. And it's only just the beginning. For everyone at CSA, ESA, and NASA, I'm so very I'm Michelle Fall. Go web. Pretty inspiring. So those are the five images that have been released today with some cool theme music. Uh, on Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern, I'm going to do um, the weekly news review, and we'll get at some of these themes there on the weekly news review as well. Uh, so do check. Uh, it's really easy to find out what I'm doing if you sign up for our my bulletin. I'll show you the link. And thanks to all the people at NASA for doing so much of that great work. There's a j.mp slash revchem bulletin to sign up for alerts. Uh, on Friday, for sure, we're going to discuss the implications of what you saw today, if you did. And if you didn't, um, you'll see it for, for the first time Friday. Here's a little bit more from NASA, the imagery of creating this tool uh we're really good at tool making humans um and now we have to learn how to deploy them as much as possible for for the betterment of humanity and uh try to limit the downsides which have been on display lately unfortunately through um, the activities of vladimir putin and so many other people who put technology to its worst possible uses this is andy revkin the Columbia University Climate School, and your sustainable blogger and dispatch, dispatcher. I'll be signing off momentarily. Uh, you can download these images yourself at webtelescope.org. Web, obviously, with two Bs. Johnny, thank you uh, for joining me. And do share this with others um, if you get a chance. In a second, I'll flip over to show you the uh, where you can find the images. Uh, actually, you know what? I'll just post the link. There's the link, uh, webtelescope.org, resource gallery. And they're very high resolution, so you can kind of dive into the images yourself and uh, have a look. It's very inspiring. Thanks again. I'm going to sign off momentarily.